Hi, good morning. This is Rose. Hello, hi, Rose. How are you doing? Good. I'm just joining by audio this morning because I have a meeting at 10. Ah, I'm I see. To go to. Okay. No, David? Not yet. I'm so surprised. <laughs> yeah, he's usually early. He's always on top of it. Yeah. Hey, Rob. Hey, good morning. How are things going? So far, so good. Yeah. Cool. Hello. Oh, hello. You're dialing in, right? So. I am. Yes, yeah, sorry. I have a meeting at 10 that I need to go to. Um, oh, okay. So I'm in the car. No, no problem. Uh, so I'm going to drop off early. Oh, that's fine. So, shall we jump in? How are you, Pam? Good, good. How are so you? You attempted to read this book how long ago? Uh, it was during grad school, like a long time ago, uh, more around 10 years ago, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get very far and uh, reading the encyclopedia now I know why I didn't even know how to read it the way they number the sections to relate to each other it's not explained you just have to know it uh, but uh, yeah I'm not sure I understand what I read now either so you can you guys can tell me what you understood out of the what he's trying to say I mean I get it at a very high level but I don't see I don't understand why he's saying what he's saying <laughs> Okay, uh, does anyone want to take a run at it? Uh, Rose, do you have a, do you, can you share a little bit about what your thoughts are? Yeah, so I guess this reminded me a lot of the structural causal model sort of stuff, right, where we have this context associated with whatever we're trying to say, except instead of talking about probabilities, we're talking about something, as far as I can see, he's always talking about something that's deterministic. And so it's always just a straightforward, it's true or it's false. And if you can't say that about something, you shouldn't say anything at all. So if we can't say that a proposition is true, we just shouldn't, we shouldn't say anything about it. And I kind of liked that piece of it. Um, <clears throat> I think where it kind of fell down for me is that, so I guess maybe just to go back a little further, sounds like he's, some of the big changes that he's making is he's talking in terms of facts instead of objects. And so at any point in time, you're, you're talking about a set of facts um, and you build those facts into a picture and your picture is your model of reality. And so you have a state of affairs which can be actual or possible, but the actual is, is the world as it is, right? That is reality as it is right now. And your state of affairs is basically a collection of facts and the facts are I guess that there are objects that have relationships with each other. So the facts include things about, I guess the objects are the context to the facts. Does that sound about right? Very good, no, very good. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, your comment about um, talking using probabilities to try and make arguments is a very relevant one and it's one that Taleb uh, speaks to in his conversation with Wolfram and from Taleb's point of view he agrees with Wittgenstein which is is that trying to use uncertain arguments uh, as a way of convincing somebody to do something is uh, fraught with peril right so if you're not sure yeah. say, say nothing uh, because otherwise you're just yeah. essentially manipulating people and it's it's coercion as opposed to a factual science. I'm not saying I'm agreeing with this, but I'm just saying that Taleb right. makes the same point that we value yeah. uncertainty. I agree with that actually. Highly. I I agree with that. I think we've we've we have 
turned the sort of null hypothesis and, and, and hypothesis testing into something that it was never meant to be. We're turning it into a fact when it's not actually a fact, right? It's just likely as opposed to a fact. Right. So this and I like that piece yeah. of what he's saying here, but, but, but then I don't it's see a problem with that. Like, so what is the problem with, with that? Like, the, the, like let's say let's say somebody comes up with a hypothesis and they say, okay, eighty percent that's true, twenty percent is false. It's still, if you have to make a decision, you can use that to make your decision, even though it's not a hundred percent fact. What is the problem with that? I guess I'm missing that. I love that you say that. If you have to make a decision, but a lot yeah. of the time it's applied when we don't have to make a decision. And we're forced to make a decision based on facts when we actually haven't allowed enough time to pass to truly make an informed decision. That's the piece but, of it that drives me crazy. Like we but that's also a like decision, right? Being, like not, not making a decision is also a decision, right? So the question is, if you know 80% something is true, is it a good decision to take action or not to take action at all? This gets into economics. Sorry. So a lot of the time, I think that yeah. it's taken out of. I, I think it's the decisions are made by somebody else mm -hmm. because they're facts, right? It's like, what's wrong with you? Why wouldn't you do this? This is good for you. This is a fact. Not known that it's good. Not known that it's good. For you. It's just known that it's good and known that it's good. For you. Right. I see. And so it comes down to who is the decision maker and yeah, like I think it takes decisions out of people's hands because we misinterpret when we're using probability, we interpret, we misinterpret what that really means. And I think we mm -hmm. see this a lot in like public discourse right now, right? The way people talk about things, well, it's a fact, it's a scientifically proven fact. Well, I'd love to find one of those in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> of course, science never proves anything. It only disproves things. So uh, there is no scientifically well, proven facts. <laughs> yeah, that's my view. If yeah. you're a good scientist, right? The uh, other thing that I really thought was interesting about this and, and sort of how it relates to some of the other stuff that we've talked about is the idea of layers of abstraction. So like he... He sort of talks about like successive application of this, right? So you create your your, your propositions with truth values associated with them. And then you basically successively apply that to, to build up more and more complex propositions and truths. But I think in the real world, it becomes a lot more difficult because of the difficulty in defining objects, right? He says objects are simple, but objects really aren't simple because there are layers of abstraction with them. Like when we talk about, for example, a person, can we really just think in terms of the person or do we need to get down to a more granular level as to what makes up the person, right? And at what level should we look at something? Are we looking at it at an atomic level or are we looking at it at a... Um, you know, an organ level or whatever, mm -hmm. a personality level, I don't know. Very good points. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so uh, very good. So he is suggesting that, um, So rather than, okay, so a, a scientific study is done and it says that 51% likelihood is this and 49% likelihood is that and 2% error, okay? And, uh, you know, the manager walks in and just says, give me the facts, you know, should I, should I go or no go? Uh, go, okay. So we've elevated this really dubious possibility, um, probability into a fact. And then we build on that fact, and we keep building on that fact, and we keep building on that fact. And that leads us into what we can simply just call nonsense, right? Or, or just rubbish, basically, because it's just pure extrapolation based on arbitrary premises. So 
His solution is to stop talking. Uh, clearly, the internet has shown that that's not a popular choice. Um, but he's a lot more extreme than that. I mean, what you explained makes sense, but I think he's way more extreme than that, right? Like, I, I took a note here. You guys read about the unsinning propositions, nonsensical ones. Some example of what he considers a nonsensical proposition is like one is a number or uh, there are objects. So these are all nonsensical propositions in his book. So that goes way beyond like whether something has low probability of being the truth. This is like you're saying you can't even say there are objects. That's a nonsensical statement. So basically, I think, I don't know if it, it's mentioned in the encyclopedia, but that seems to be related to what Goodell's theorem was saying, right? You can't have a sentence referring to its own. That's nonsensical. That causes, I guess, later on inconsistencies and paradoxes. Um, so that's the part I don't quite understand. Like if you go, if you put the bar as like one is a number is nonsensical, uh, then uh, then I think he's right that you can't really say anything about anything. So you should just stop. <laughs> okay, but he does make another very important distinction, which is to know doesn't mean that you need to be able to speak it in words, right? I know what it is to feel hungry, but I can't explain it to you. I, you know, I know what it is to feel tired, but it's very hard to explain it to you. Words yeah, that, that's a fair <laughs> point. Yeah. So we need other representations and that beyond language. Sorry, go ahead, Rose. Yeah. No, I was just going to say it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Hume discussion too, right, of the circular argument. Right, in order to say those things, you need to build it up out of something else. And you come to a point where, like, if there is no a priori knowledge that you just take as being a fact, right, you, you, you always hit a point where you're like, okay, now I've just, I have a circular argument. Right. I'm not arguing with his insights, I just don't know how we can use them. I mean, we could just run away and stop talking about a whole bunch of stuff. I don't think that would be particularly useful. So what are the, <clears throat> what are the implications of putting bounds on the power of language? Rob, what, what do you think? Do you, what, what was your take on all of this? Um, yeah, I mean, when, you know, part of the problem I have with reading things like this and you know I realize they're sort of you know abbreviated um but sort of you know where the boundaries are um you know what's the boundary of a proposition what's the boundary of a fact um you know and, and I was kind of looking at this with an eye towards the question you just Pose, David, um, and I'm not. I mean, nothing really jumps out at me, at least not yet. Sort of in my mind, it's it's kind of vague. I'm trying to think. Okay, um, you know, what are, what sort of what are the operational, you know, the applied philosophy uh, implications of this and. Okay, so we have a, a barrier between sense and nonsense, and the stuff that's in the nonsense is uh, probably uncomfortably large. Um, so, you know, does it mean we focus more on Again, sort of, you know, I, I guess the, the practical implication is if we can figure out what that sort of sense and nonsense boundary is, if we could then, you know, if we're getting close to it and we see it's going to be in the nonsense part, kind of, you know, jettison that and then focus on the on the stuff that's left. I got this quote from the from the reading. I think it tries to answer the same question, see if it makes any sense to you. So this is what this is a quote from Wittgenstein trying to tell you what how to use what he says in the Tractatus. He says it is used it is to be used in order to climb. It's it's a it's a metaphor of a ladder to express the function of the Tractatus. It is to be used in order to climb on it in order to see the world rightly. 
but thereafter, it must be recognized as nonsense and be thrown away. <laughs> so use it to understand everything and then throw it away because it's all nonsense. <laughs> I don't know. I, I might, might uh, maybe I should have read the later part of uh, the guy. Um, <laughs> so in the second work that he did, which we'll cover next time, Philosophical Investigations, my interpretation after listening to this for hours on my walks was he shows how broken language can be. Like he, he constructs all of these nonsense phrases, which are, you know, very very close to being very reasonable and believable phrases and they kind of anyway it's, it's i mean the, the big takeaway for me is and I, I had this takeaway some time ago and was just reinforcing it is that language has its limits that's all like we, when we create these linguistic models when we create these laws when we create these medical textbooks and this goes back to taleb as well um the words aren't enough, right? You need to have embodied practices to go along with the words. You need to be able to have other ways of, of collecting information and knowledge about the world that aren't linguistic. They might be pictorial, they might be sensorial, I don't know. But um, yeah, so this idea of putting hard limits on language, I think is, is a good one. Uh, I think that language does have its limits. Um, and trying to codify everything in language, um, is challenging for sure if not a completely a complete folly but um okay we kind of beat that one to death i just wanted to cover another very interesting point which i've seen coming up all over the place um which is the absence of arrows in causal diagrams and the absence of arrows in diagrams themselves as being information so i actually think that in let's say if we take a causal dag um the fact that an arrow does not exist between two nodes is actually more significant than if an arrow does exist. Because you're making the strong claim that there is no um, uh, covariance between these parameters. There's no hidden third parameter and there's no causal relationship between these two things at all. They're truly independent. Um, and category theory makes the same claim. And that to me is, is, is very challenging, right? I mean... Sorry, it doesn't say they're independent, right? It just says they're causally not related. They could be totally correlated and dependent if they are mediated by other nodes. Sure. So what is the significance of a lack of an arrow between two nodes in a causal diagram? It makes a huge difference, right? Like if you remember the... The, let's say the, the collider, for example. Uh, so if you don't connect the top two nodes. Right. So basically, if they are connected, it, it doesn't really matter what the other node is. They're always going to be connected. But if they're not connected, then it really matters whether you do, do a do operation on the collider or not. And then it would make them related or non-related, not related. So I think you're right that it's it's very significant assumption to remove an arrow because if you put an arrow and it ends up the the causal relation is little, that's fine. You can probably find very small causal relations, but then if you remove it, there's no way you can make them causally uh, directly dependent on each other. So that is a significant assumption. I think you're right. Uh, it, it seems, yeah, it, it seems to me as. Um, You know, the default ought to be to start from a framework where there are no arrows. And then you gradually start putting the arrows in. Not the other way around? Where everything's connected and you start taking arrows out? <sighs> yeah. Because as far as you know, everything could be connected. I mean, I mean, in practice, I agree with you that you don't, you can draw every arrow and then try to prune it but uh just like logically it makes sense to assume everything is connected with everything and then only make assumption when you're sure they're not right so if we take say a cnn right so a cnn uh, structure as i understand it is making the assumption of uh, local effects only 
right? So things over there don't affect things over here, right? There is no action at a distance in pictures. And so the only things that the, the nodes are connected to are things that are spatially nearby, right? And then all the other nodes aren't connected to that, right? So loca locality or, or proximity or context uh, seems to be one way that we can safely introduce uh, or, or ignore arrows because we say if something is distant and we're only considering local effects, then distant objects aren't connected to this because they're they're distant, right? And that's, that's... I don't think that's quite true. Uh, so it is true that like convolutional uh, layers are they have that locality. You look at the neighbors, and the reason for that it basically tries to impose translation invariance. So if right. you have a ball in bottom left corner of the picture or the top right, you get activations that are similar it's not just it has it doesn't have to be in the center so the position doesn't matter but but you put usually the convolutional layers in stacks and that increases your receptive fields which means you are making things connected wider and wider and wider um, and there are different versions of it that make it scale invariant it works at different scales so you will have a layer that looks at the whole picture then you have other layers that look at smaller patches uh, so it, I don't think it's true to say that you only look at the local pixel, assume that only the local Maybe pixels distance is the wrong metric, and I, I accept your argument. It's a good one. But my, my point is, is that we don't build CNNs out of fully connected layers, right? Yeah, that's a different thing, yeah. Yeah, well, no, I, I agree that's a different thing. But the fully connected layer is everything has a relationship to everything, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... In certain situations, uh, we need to have arrows between everything. And in other situations, due to some inductive bias, as Rob Ness would say, we perhaps we need to, uh, we can sever some of the connections and, and reduce the, the complexity of the, the model. So I always worked around the additive model that Rob uh, proposed where you start with a bunch of things and then you start relating them because we already, and, and this gets back to facts, right? And category three and a whole bunch of other stuff, but we start off with a fact, right? And birds can fly, okay? And then we, um, we then draw connections to that fact between other facts, as opposed to saying everything can fly except rocks or something, I don't know. But, um, <clears throat> So this, it's very interesting to think about that I inside we, as well. Go ahead, Rose. I was just gonna say, I think we also need to do interventions though to, to basically test and try and falsify what we have. And that to me was always the power of the causal diagram, right? Like I think this is the case. And if I do an intervention here, I would not expect these other very. I would not expect to see variation in these other variables, right? And so you're constantly trying to refine your graph by doing interventions to test your graph. Right, which is very Bayesian. Um, okay, so once again, I kind of get back to the practicality of this. Um, so. Is there a way in which, or has there been an attempt at making a clear distinction between the boundary between sense and nonsense? I mean, Wittgenstein throws out these clever examples, but he doesn't really give us a rule of thumb or even a heuristic by which we could make the assessment if something is nonsense or sense, did he? Or did I miss that? Um, I didn't see that. But I guess what is, like I, I mean, I would even take it a step back. Like, what is nonsense? Like that we wanted. Maybe that's the same question. <laughs> um, yeah, the, like, yeah, the absence of sense, I guess. Yeah, but in I what sense are we sense. looking yeah. for the absence of sense? Well, well, I mean, stable, right? So, go ahead, Rose. Right, it's nonsense if you can't define a truth table for it. You oh. can't define your proposition. And have a truth table there for it, then you have to put it in the nonsense category. I don't think that's it's true. Fact. Haven't... Because there are statements that are true, but you can't, let's say, even fundamentally know that their truth value, but they are either true or false. That's what Goodell's theorems are, right? There are statements 
that you can formulate that are either true or false, but there is no logical way to get at the answer. But that's not nonsense. That just means you can't put a truth to it. I, I'm saying nonsense in the Wittgenstein definition of nonsense. I don't think he's truly saying it's it's meaningless or whatever. He's just saying you can't talk about that in terms of statement of fact. You might know it, right? You know it on a different level, but it's it's mysticism, <laughs> right? The way you're knowing it is not because you've built it up from the ground, from known truths. So, what would Winston, what would Wittgenstein uh, say about uh, Bayes' theorem? I have no clue. I mean, I think we need to at least read the second half. I I think what I I, I guess back to the very start. I think he's dealing with things that are deterministic. He's not dealing with probability. If it's probability, it's nonsense. Right? And I, I think that it, it comes down to there are probably mm. very few things that we can define as sense, and we don't always know how to distinguish between no sense and nonsense. Right? And, and that we need to do a better job of basically understanding we're dealing with nonsense right now. We haven't actually been able to build it from the ground up. So before you and go, so I'll there's just make still it, uncertainty there. I just want to make a quick uh, interpretive ahead. difference between. I know you've got to go in like two minutes. So before you go, I just want to kind of poke this mm -hmm. in. Um, so my interpretation is quite different. When he says no nonsense, I literally mean no inner sense in the Kantian sense. In that. Quantum mechanics, when I studied it all those years ago, made no sense to me in that I never developed an intuition for it at all. Like there was this guy at the front of the, and standing in front of a board, writing equations and talking, and I'd go through these mathematical exercises and I'd come to an answer at the end. And it would make no sense to me. I don't feel good about the answer. I don't feel bad about the answer. I don't know if the answer is right or wrong, and I don't really care, right? So it's about caring to me. It's not about a truth table. It's actually about an emission of some internal kind of biochemical that makes me have a feeling about this thing. Uh, so I'm just saying my interpretation is different. I'm not saying your interpretation is incorrect. It's just two different ways. So are you saying it's a personal thing? Like one person's nonsense is another person's sense, the way mm -hmm. you're explaining it? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody so I guess I was using nonsense in the way I, I think that, that they're talking about it here. Like it, sure. I'm not yeah. saying that's what I think nonsense is. Oh, I'm okay. using that was his definition of it. Unless you can build it from the ground up as it. Like this is from first principles, right? I've come here, I have a whole list of facts that I've based this fact on, then it, it's not sense yet. But then right? wouldn't the, your, like, we just, but go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask, but then wouldn't your first principles that you're basing everything on are also nonsense because you didn't get them from any other principle. At some point, you've got to make stuff up before you can make sense other things, right? So that's where I think the whole ladder thing comes in, right? And I think it just comes back to Hume's argument too, right? You get into these circular arguments at some point in time. And so at some point you have to, these are my first principles, right? These are the atomic facts that I am that I am using. But then it's not clear where you draw the line, right? Like the fact that there are objects, I could say, I assume that that's my principle. And then I build things on top of that. And well, who is Wittgenstein to tell me that that's nonsense and something else that he decides is sense? How do we decide that? It right. seems like a matter of taste, not a matter of like logic. <laughs> and when you say taste, I, I literally interpret that to be taste, like taste, taste. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, an apperception. A sense. I have to go, but okay. I'll see you next week. Okay. Right. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your contribution. Cheers. Um, yeah, I had one other question that kind of came to mind as I was reading that, though. Um, is there a role for for humor and for puns? 
they are sensible in that they evoke a strong emotional reaction. So well, sure. well, yeah, yeah, but it, it's sort of kind of the notion of what language is, I guess. Well, I explained to you on Wednesday what my notions of system two were, right? That it salts the soup, as it were. But um, I should explain that to Payam at some point. Okay, so suppose, but yeah, just take this one. Suppose we said sense and nonsense. Okay, nonsense is N-O-N hyphen C-E-N-T-S. Okay. Is that the same or different? <laughs> I see your point. Uh, um, but, you know, th th this is part of my struggle to sort of understand the boundaries of stuff. Sure. I mean, I struggle with Wittgenstein myself, to be brutally honest here. Like, it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me. Uh, and when you, if you bother to read either of his books, I haven't read Tractatus, I can only imagine it's mental torture because. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, his philosophical investigations is this kind of rambling breaking of language. Well, maybe it's not random, maybe it's very being very deliberate, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think the language is important, but I guess I'm seeing it being important in kind of different ways. Yeah, I like the way he defines philosophy. It's like at, at eight, this is another quote from the thing. He says, philosophy is not a theory or a doctrine, but rather an activity. It's an activity of clarification of thoughts and more so of criti critique of language. So that's his definition of love, which I totally I, I, I like. That makes sense. Like if you think of it that way, it's just like a game we're playing with words and take it as it is, like, it's not useful. We just do it to get at, to understand things better, but then you go back to your life and you get rid of all this nonsense. <laughs> that was my interpretation. <laughs> yeah, but we live in language. So we, we, we face a choice here, right? So we can, like political language is not, political language is about, uh, strong emotion, I'll say, right? You're trying, you're not trying to make rational arguments in political discourse, right? You're trying to make uh, arguments that are sensible in the sense I mean, taste, touch, strong feelings, right? You're trying to manipulate the person's emotional state so that they are aligned with your emotional state about some... Yeah, so that's related to the other article you shared, right? That was about uh, language as a form of deception. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess it goes back to what is the purpose of language? It has many purposes. I guess this is just one purpose to get at the truth and understand the world. And this guy is saying there is many ways you can go wrong and get into nonsensical answer because of shortcomings of language. But if you want to use the language to, you know, buy groceries or manipulate people to giving you what you want, maybe it's working just fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just when you, if you want to use it to get at the truth, then you're going to run into trouble. Fair comment. I would agree with that generally. Yeah, I mean, as I see it, sort of ideas or truths are sort of multidimensional. And I view language as more of a, Kind of a subset of that dimension, a label that we put on uh, a certain characteristic. Um, but you know, we're, we're running into situations. Uh, I mean, I can't speak about Canada, but certainly here in the U.S., in which language has gotten to be a real issue, um, in part because this is my interpretation, it's being redefined um, in ways that people kind of assert <laughs> an advantage from it. Uh, so, I mean, like uh, the notion of racism here in the US has been uh, systematically redefined. So in the eyes of many, uh, since I'm a white person, uh, I'm obviously racist. Okay. Um, yeah, and, you know, but this is done, so they are defining racism 
in kind of a different context, and they're assuming that I sort of rely upon the traditional definition, and therefore that since that's something I would like to avoid being labeled as, you know, I adjust my behavior in ways that they find attractive. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a, a situation in my university where um, some guy opened the door for someone who happened to be a girl, and then uh, she, she took that as being a sexist act and slapped the guy. Right. So yeah, well, I have personal experiences, not being slapped, but people getting mad at me for opening the door. But I mean, I opened the door for all my guy friends too. I mean, there's no difference. I didn't think, oh, you can't open the door because you're a woman. You. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, okay, yeah, so, so who's the sexist in that uh, situation? Yeah, that's a good point. It could totally be the other way around, yeah. Like if a woman opened the door for that person, they'll probably be fine with it. But since the guy opened it, they get mad. So, so that's guilty also of being a guy, the bastard. <laughs> but, you know, if you open the door for everybody. Exactly. How can you, how can someone assert that that's a sexist behavior unless it's, I don't know, I mean, you know, rooted in, uh, you know, ancestral tradition or something like that. I don't know. Uh, being nice to other people is in my ancestral tradition. <laughs> but even if, let's say, but, but even taking it another level, if you open the door, let's say, only for women, is that sexist? I mean, I, I would be totally fine if women wanted to open the door for me. I mean, I, I would take it, I would be appreciative. Like, why is that sexist? I have no idea, but at that time, uh, there were, the women had declared war on men, and all men were evil. And if you look like a guy, you're evil, even if you're gay. <laughs> well, you know, so, simple rules of thumb have have some virtue. Um, they're often over extrapolated. Um, very interesting. But I mean, what would Wittgenstein say about this? Would he say? I think he, I thought all of ethics was in the nonsensical regime. So he doesn't even talk about ethics or social rules or all of that that falls on the nonsense. Yeah, you know, he used to hang out with Bertrand Russell, who was a no nonsense kind of guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> It sounded like him. There was a quote that he referred to Wittgenstein as not so dumb. <laughs> he seemed like a tough guy to hang around. I praise, huh? <laughs> I praise Bertrand Russell. Um, well, um, I get his point, and it actually uh, it adds nuance to my own understanding, which I think I should probably share with the group at some point soon. I, I, Robert, what did you think of that? You've had a few days to think about what I was talking about on Wednesday. Did that resonate, or did you just come across? It don't know, make weird? sense to me. Okay. Do you think it would um, be worth to bring it to the group and have them kind of critique it? Sure. Why not? Okay. I might. I might kind of because it's highly related to the work, right? It's highly related to Wittgenstein and. Um, uh, the other stuff that we've been covering. So I might, I might kind of uh, inject that into the mix next week and we can poke at that for a bit and see if that. Yeah, happens. I mean, I don't, you know, to be honest, I don't see a lot of parallels, but uh, I'm curious as, you know, you've thought about this a lot more than I am. So I'm curious to, uh, sure. what you come up with. Okay, so I might, I might throw that into the mix uh, next time. What is this meeting on Wednesdays that you guys have? at a class or no no we just hang out together on wednesdays you're welcome to join uh yeah. it's okay. uh very welcome uh by the way <laughs> completely welcome what time is it rob uh it's uh 8 a.m um, on wednesdays Thank yeah you it's time. 11 o'clock eastern so eight o'clock in the morning for you, right? well, I'll, I'll be at work on wednesday at 8 a.m <laughs> that's a bummer no we'd love to have you there don't, 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 appreciate don't, it yeah yeah absolutely it's just uh, two of you yeah yeah, yeah so rob's been teaching me economics <laughs> okay well that's nice yeah and, and david's been teaching me everything else oh, no. uh so we've been discussing um the uh black shoals stuff have you looked at black shoals at all it's, i know it because it's very similar to the heat equation but that's i've right. never like thought about it in terms of financial markets yeah yeah so my understanding well, it's of it worth is... a couple billion dollars just a yeah, heat equation observation yeah 
trillion <laughs> probably instead of yeah. But my take on it is, is the true innovation of Black Shoals is they were able to ride chaos, right? They they could they could build a little platform that could sit on top of this very very chaotic system and float along with it, right? So as it goes up and down, it kind of goes up and down with it and doesn't kind of fall apart or fall over or that kind of a process is very rare in my opinion like i don't know many many systems that can sit on top of a chaotic engine that actually remains reasonably stable no. but but remember what did i miss the, 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 the whole notion of derivatives pricing and finance uh derivatives is not a reference to you know mathematical rates of change but it's a reference to a price of something derived upon the price of something else. So the price of an option conditional upon the price of the underlying stock or whatever. Right. So in that sense, it does make sense to be able to sort of ride on top of the chaos because you're taking that chaos sort of as given, and then you're describing a response to that. So my suggestion is, is that, that our internal systems, our biology is chaotic, extremely chaotic. And we have many, many systems that work on principles, I would argue, very similar to the heat equation or black shoals, whichever way you want to think about it that actually allow state stability to exist in this chaotic. Uh, so when you say chaotic, do you mean it in a technical term, like small fluctuation in initial conditions rise? Predictability to is you can't get close to 100 like percent. Fundamentally or because it's so complex that we don't know how to do it, because chaos means fundamentally you cannot predict, whereas complicated system that we don't have good models of, we can't predict, but it may be in principle you could, right? Um, I think I think it would be uh, yeah more the latter. So chaos is kind of our nonsense category for you know stuff that we don't understand. Um, but um, you know it's you, sort of a, a medical issue. I've played around with yeah played around with this. Share it with with David too. Um, but. Suppose you wanted to generate a uh, I don't know an estimation process that looked at your heartbeat and tried to use that to characterize uh, the state of your health. Mm -hmm. Um. The only stuff that we have out there really uh, are there's really are these really bizarre kind of chaotic type models. Um, and to me, they sort of just inherently don't make any sense. And I'm kind of surprised that they actually wind up being useful for anything. <laughs> So what do people do? I just assume they look at your baseline and if you deviate from it beyond some threshold then they sound the alarm or is that- No, to do something um, what they do is, okay, so in time series um, analysis, there's uh, the notion of stationary. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that, you know, if you kind of exist in, you know, some abstractly defined set of, you know, the data and the parameters, you're not gonna get outside of that. So if we have something like a random walk, that's actually as an autocorrelation coefficient of one. And what that winds up, um, what that winds up doing is generating observations that can go, you know, infinitely high or infinitely low, and therefore are deemed non-stationary. So these heart rate models, 
are getting basically autocorrelation coefficients, not only that are bigger than one, so in other words, inherently non-stationary, but uh, like, you know, bigger than two. I really don't know what that means. Um, and then people talk about sort of the magnitude of, of how big they, these are, and if they're bigger than some value empirically, it means that uh, it's good for you. And if they're less than that, it means it's not so good for you. Um, Isn't that the Wittgenstein definition of nonsense, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. okay, but you know, here, here we're back to sort of, you know, uh, you know Rose's dichotomy. Um, okay, well, just because something doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean it's, it's nonsense, you know, it just may mean- It's nonsense you know, to you, and that's one- my, 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 You know, my bandwidth yeah. is sufficiently small, I can't see it. But if um, you put our engineering hat on, like if they use whatever complicated, chaotic model they want to use, I mean, are they successful? Like, can you actually detect real heart failures or issues as measured by conventional ways? Kind of so they, so they claim. Um, but my conjecture is that, I mean that whole that whole just notion is just deeply suspect. Um, you know, in the same way, like, you know, I mean, what what's the average uh, or normal body temperature? Somewhere around thirty six degrees Celsius. Yeah. Somewhere. Well, I mean, there. you know, yeah. in, in Fahrenheit, you know, we say it's ninety eight point six. Okay, nobody really has got a good understanding of where that came from. You know, supposedly there was some, you know, sample done in the 1920s. So, yeah, I mean, we got no idea sort of what a normal body temperature is and whether it's high or low or, you know, abnormal. But you can measure it, no? They can, in principle, you can go find all the human beings on Earth, measure their temperature and draw the bell curve, no? Yeah, sure, we could, but my point is, is nobody's done that. Okay, <laughs> <I know. laughs> that's fair enough, yeah. Um, so, you know, again, it's sort of the boundaries between sense and nonsense. We have these sort of standardized rules of thumb, but I think there is just, you know, we, we could, you know, I guess I would characterize some of this stuff as sort of straddling the border between sense and nonsense, you know, from a economics perspective, you know, we have this phrase, it takes a model to beat a model. Um, so if 98.6 works, okay, you know, it's a simple model. Um, you know, all right, but so- you know, Maybe that's maybe, a feature, not a bug. You know, that's what makes it fun that like you're negotiating constantly the boundary between like sense and nonsense, right? And you don't know which one is which. So you have to keep doing whatever you're doing. I don't know. So, so maybe that's the definition of science. Just poking at that boundary. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or even philosophy too, right? For that matter, or anything. Yeah. But we have to accept that a lot of what is said is nonsense. I think that that's, and, and we have to make the assessment ourselves based on our personal experience that, you know, to me, quantum mechanics is nonsense. Like, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not mad at quantum mechanics. I'm not saying they're lying. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, okay. Actually, interesting. It relates to what uh, Rob was saying about, like, do you assume there are connections and you remove it, whether you assume there are no connection and you put it. Like, I guess it's, it's a matter of, uh, again, taste, like coming up to something new. Do you assume it's all bullshit until somebody convinces you or do you give them the benefit of the doubt until you realize that they're wrong? Like, those are two... I guess fundamental ways of approaching life and everything. I guess everybody probably does it differently. Well, I mean, I mean if we assume everything's connected, kind of how do we make it through our day? Yes, <laughs> we have to prune the model a bit. <laughs> no, no, but that's, yeah, that's like the most conservative assumption, right? Like if you want to like eliminate the chance of being wrong, uh, that's, that's uh, well, yeah, no, practically I, doesn't make sense. No, I'm just sort of being, trying to be pragmatic. Um, yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it just seems like a lot more mental energy to. Okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my other screen here. I've got a, uh, 
a neural net model that I ran, um, like 188 variables. It's a lot easier to go in and pick out the ones that I want rather than to go in and check off all the ones I don't want. <laughs> well, the neural net model, I guess it promises to find those connections for you. Right, so it yeah. assumes everything is connected, right? And then it goes and changes the weights based on, you don't, uh, so you do assume everything is connected, presumably if you're using a fully connected thing. Yeah, yeah, but you know, again, being pragmatic, you know, it took 12 hours to run. 12 hours for 180 parameters? Um, well, I'm doing it on my PC. Um, so yeah, I need uh I need a bigger box basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, let's see, uh two layers, uh 91 layers at the first node, 31 at the second. But, but fully connected. And that took 12. How much data do you have? Um, about 100,000 observations. Well, I think something is going wrong. I would have expected that to take like 10 minutes. Uh, do you have a G He doesn't have a GPU, though. No, it doesn't matter. Even with his CPU, that's a very, very small model. Like, um, so, M so if you do MNIST, which is I think 60,000. learning rate is low or something. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I think 12 hours is too too much. I think something is going wrong. Yeah. All right. Um, well, yeah, like I said, maybe I just, I'm not smart enough at this stuff. That, um, unless you're, are you like coding everything by hand in Python or something? Or are you using oh, no. one of these? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is using a, uh, a SAS package called JMP jump. Okay. Yeah, I don't know those. What do you guys use? Uh, you guys use Python, right? And uh, uh, Well, use... I, I like using PyTorch, uh, which is right. like a auto diff package made by, I guess, popularized Facebook. by Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's TensorFlow is a Google version, which I don't like, but yeah. Uh, there's a JAX, uh, which is all the researchers like to use. It's an auto diff package. It's just ag agnostic to uh, GPU or CPU, it just uses whatever you have. And um, re I haven't used it, but researchers really like it. It's oh. super flexible and simple. Uh, a question for you, Rob, uh, because you talked about economics. Uh, there's that famous book, The Random Walk Down Wall, Wall Street or something that uh, I started reading. And then I, I keep reading things about it. People say it's complete bullshit. And then other people cite it as the Bible of that sort of said it all and nobody has proved it wrong like what do you think of is it worth reading that first question and then the second question is like do I take what's in there as like a common knowledge between economists or economists or is that like a controversial view of the markets um okay it's I'm kind of vaguely familiar with it uh, it's that's Mackie Al's book um So I, I think the essence of it kind of gets back to the early notions of how sort of finance was constructed in, in the modern era, which is about, I don't know, post-1965. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to that, there was, you know, nobody was thinking really about sort of random walks or unpredictability. Um, and sort of embedded in that sort of post-65 development is the notion that markets efficiently respond to information. And in the process of doing that, they essentially create their own unpredictability, unpredictability. Mm -hmm. So, um, That, that's got really strong implications for a lot of things. Um, what it means, and if you look at investment management, um, you know, is it worthwhile to pay some fund manager, you know, one percent per year to go and um, manage your money? Play with your the, money. Yeah. yeah, the answer is basically not. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there, there are other reasons why that might make sense. Like, you know, if you don't want to do it or, you know, you're going to lose sleep over it or something. Um, but in that sense, um, the notion of markets efficiently reflecting information um, yeah, it's really important. And I, I think that's kind of what he was getting at. So he was saying that that's true or that's false? I, I, no, I think that in, in general, in general is true. Um, yeah, I, well, let's see. I, I spent uh, some time in Indonesia uh, working with uh, the Jakarta Stock Exchange. And they had a different, uh, this was uh, around 2000. Um, and back then they had a different technology. They literally had a whiteboard and they wrote on the whiteboard, bid prices, offer prices, and that was the market. Um, and one of the things that I was exploring is um, they did have a distinction between whether a, a bid or an offer was a foreign initiated bid or offer or domestic. And it turns out the ones that had were foreign initiated really moved the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that were domestic, not so much so. And, you know, they hadn't looked at this, but I, you know, I got the data from them and sort of, you know, was able to show that. Um, but that seemed to be that the foreign guys were reflecting sort of greater information. And consequently, it kind of made sense that those prices uh, would move. So, I mean, the foreigners were tended to be uh, asset allocators who viewed you know, Indonesia as sort of an asset class. And when they moved in, uh, they were sort of moving in sort of in force. So you know, we want to build up our position here. So if you saw a buy order, it was generally an indication there was going to be more behind it too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, where I'm going with this is, those guys, you know, in this uh, whiteboard market, figure that out. And they figured it out about right. <laughs> um, now, that was not generally available. I mean, that information there was not generally available to the people outside. But um, so it's just this information was being sort of appropriately reflected and showing up in the prices. So, I mean, that, that's sort of, that's kind of an efficient market. So, so I guess, sorry, go ahead. sorry, just a follow-up question. I guess what makes that book or that hypothesis uh, controversial is, as you were saying, if that's true, that my market is, let's say, absolutely efficient on average, then there shouldn't be a huge opportunity to make lots of money, regardless of how smart you are. And I guess a lot of people question that assumption and point at people who have been successful for like 50 years, making lots of money for their clients or for themselves. Or... Yeah. Um... Yeah, two a couple comments on that. One is that my view is that markets are about as efficient as they ought to be. <laughs> that sounds like a tautology. Uh, but what I mean is that if you have a mechanism for systematically outperforming the market, okay, that's actually a very valuable asset. And you can sell that for a whole bunch of money. Now, um, what that in turn means is that if we as investors want to access that, it's gonna cost us a lot of money to do it. And then after we access it, um, well, 
becomes useless, I guess, over time. <laughs> you know that you know maybe that's just sort of offsetting the fee we have to pay. Benefit you get is the same as the cost you have to put to get the information in the first place. Yeah, basically you're paying for in you know paying for uh, superior analysis or information. Um, so in that sense, there's sort of an efficiency part. But the other part too is if you look at if you look at the raw data, uh, this is, I've, I've done this for mutual funds, haven't done it for hedge funds, um, but roughly speaking, you know, if we have a thousand mutual funds in any given year, about half of them are gonna outperform a common benchmark like the S&P 500 and half of them are gonna underperform. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next year, guess what? We're going to see the same thing. About half of those that outperformed are going to outperform in the second year. And it's a random half? <laughs> well, okay. Now, you know, the question is, could you predict these? Um, and that that's sort of a little more of a subtle question. But, you know, you do it a third year, you see the same thing. So it's it's kind of coin flipping, to be honest, to a first approximation. So, yeah. you know, the, the, best, the best investment advice is probably take, uh, you know, low cost index funds, um, you know, and put your money there and sort of, you know, hope for the best. Um, I mean, there's one that I've got uh, my kids in, uh, ticker symbol is VT. So it's basically a global index fund. Um, so that's my best bet on what's gonna generate good returns over the next 30 or 40 years. So, but one of the things you really gotta pay attention to is the expenses. Uh, people, people got no idea how uh, how important those are. The friction, as it were. Yeah. Okay. So, if you look at nominal returns over the you know past century in the U.S., uh, they average about ten percent a year. Um, if you look at a typical mutual fund, it might charge one to one and a half percent in fees per year. Okay, so if you take, you know, $10,000 and multiply it by 1.1 to the 40th power, and then if you take $10,000 and multiply it by 1.085 to the 40th power, you know, you're going to see those two are going to be different by about 50, you know, by about 50%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the best single bits of advice then is, you know, just sort of buy and hold and buy something that's got, or invest in something that's got really low cost, low expenses, uh, which is typically an index fund or something like that that's not doing much trading. How, how do you get that? How do you buy those? Sorry, I completely, so I have a bunch of mutual funds. So uh, oh, how okay. do you... Yeah, so you would recommend that you would move. So where do you find these? Like, is that something I maintain? I go and like, I can directly buy an index fund? Yeah, I, you know, usually those are among the, the standard options that you've got, you know, pretty much everywhere. Okay. Uh, so Vanguard is a pretty good company um, that's got a lot of index funds. Some of them are set up as what are called ETFs, exchange traded funds. Some of them are set up as mutual funds. Um, not a whole lot of difference. You can trade an ETF during the day. You can only trade a mutual fund uh, at the end of day price. Okay. But, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you know, 30 year horizons, um, that's not much of a difference. Mm -hmm. But you get expense ratios out of those of about 10 basis points. So you got mm, 100 basis points is 1%. So that's one tenth of 1%. That's pretty good. And that's usually about as, yeah, about as good as you can do. Um, mm -hmm. But that's yeah. a heck of a lot better than a percent and a half. 
Yeah, yeah. Every time I bring this up with my, uh, so I have all my mutual funds through CIBC, just was banking, and they called me, and I went for. It. I didn't know anything about it, but so they they convince me every time that their mutual funds are outperforming everything, and the cost is low. So I, I brought up the index funds and say, oh yeah, that's essentially what it is. It is an index fund that you are uh, basically invested into, but they do charge that one one and a half percent. So. Um, See, yeah, see if you can get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should look into it because I'm like putting in money every month into it automatically. Yep. So it's growing. Uh, so yeah, I guess I don't want to, yeah, it's, there's probably fees and other things that they they punish you with if you try to leave, right? Mm -hmm. well, you know, not, not, not so much of that, but I mean, this is something that people don't realize, but finance is really a very, a very heavily intermediated business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are lots of people who got their hands out at different stages in the process. Mm -hmm. But, you yes. know, it, my conjecture is, um, you know, if you look at the, uh, the distribution of investment returns 30 years from now, um, you're going to find putting money into sort of broad-based index funds, um, is going to put you, I don't know, in the top 90, 95% of that outcome. I'll just talk to you about this. Let's get a bit of, uh, yeah, index funds, and you recommend Vanguard. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I got trapped into the whole. So the Canadian banks really, 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 and the Canadian government really, really, really want you to kind of do your investment through the banks. I don't know why. Um, but there are strong incentives for you to go through bank RRSPs and other things. So I've got a bunch of money tied up in RRSPs, but it's all locked away in the bank and I can't really touch it. So. Well, if, if, yeah, I mean, if you guys got specific questions, just, you know, show me what your alternatives are and uh, we can look at them. Sure. I mean, Shepard, I don't spend a lot of time on this. Sounds like I am actively, actively looking into this, but we kind of... I mean, I don't really up, want to. By the way, like we completely ignored this for like twenty years, and it's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't really want to be actively managing my own funds. I just don't have the time or interest. I just want to find something that's reasonable, doesn't have high fees, and I mean, the whole way they take the expense that reminds me of. I don't know, like you like Talib, uh, David. Uh, one of his favorite, my favorite book of him is Skin in the Game. Uh, which as you can tell by the title what he means it basically says like if the person investing your money doesn't have skin in the game you can't trust it like because they take their percentage no matter what happens in the market they have no incentive to do better for you uh don't trust them <laughs> don't trust the experts that take a fee that's that they get paid regardless of how you do i mean sure they get paid more if they do well but uh <laughs> Yeah, be careful of that logic too, uh, for the following reason. Um, okay, I'm an investment advisor. Um, I only do well when you do well. Makes sense. Okay, now how well do I do when you do well? All right, so if you look at a typical hedge fund, um, it's fee structure is usually set up as what's called a 220. So they charge 2% of the assets under management upfront. And then they take 20% of the upside above some benchmark rate of return, like a T-bill rate or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it turns out you can value that 20% component as a call option using Black-Scholes. So it's 20% of in at the money volatility with the time horizon of, you know, typically a year or two years. Um, and you're gonna see that the value of that that you're giving up is pretty significant. It's probably, you know, it's close to one and a half, two percent right there. Of the total asset, not the upside. Yeah, okay, so that's what you're giving up up front. And so these people say, yeah, gee, I only make money when you make money. Well, okay. <laughs> what you're doing is you're giving them an option value. Mm -hmm. Now, what that also means is they've got an incentive to maximize the value of that option. Now, how do they do that? 
Well, they do it by increasing the volatility of the underlying investments. Uh, which generally- so can play games with you, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if you maybe the boring banks in Canada are actually a good approach then. If you look at the world- They're heavily regulated, so. If you look at the world of hedge fund returns, they actually look pretty good. But here's a proviso. There is a huge bias in what gets reported. So mm -hmm. for example, you've got a company has two hedge funds. Uh, one of them bets the market's gonna go up, the other bets the market's gonna go down. And they go out and they run them for three years. So they're trying to get enough uh, you know, track record to uh, make it into the kind of normal hedge fund listing alternatives that people would choose from. So what do you think they do? They're only going to report the one that did well. The one that didn't do bad that they've run in, well, that's never going to see the light of day. Yeah. But there are some legendary hedge funds, right, that have done like consistently well over like 50, 60 years, right? I don't remember the yep. names, but there is some that are closed and you can't just get in like just exactly. I mean, yeah, you can't get you can't get into them. Um, but just yeah. the fact that they exist, doesn't that suggest that they're onto something? Or do you think it's a massive fluke that they could be successful over decades? Um, Other factors, I would argue. Okay, so in my kind of limited experience, um, all right, so, okay, we're kind of, well, let me go through this example. So, um, the guy who has the office next to me um, was doing some research on what was called stock option backdating. Okay, that sounds really arcane. But what it was is when companies issue stock options to employees, mm -hmm. generally they issue them, um, you know, like, okay, uh, you know, we're going to issue our options on February 1. And, you know, the employees that we like, you know, we're going to give them these options. They're going to be the strike price and stuff like that. And typically the strike price is actually set to the current stock price, at least in the U.S., because they're kind of accounting reasons that dictate that. So what companies were doing is they were going backwards in time. So at the end of the year, they would go back and say, yeah, we're giving a whole bunch of options to people, or we've given a whole bunch of options to people. And we gave them on uh, August 27th. That was when we granted these options. Well, it turns out August 27th was actually the low price of the stock during the year. So in other words, they were looking backwards in time and figuring out when the best time to award the stock options was. And then they were saying, well, that's when we actually did it. Now they weren't doing it then, they were waiting to the end of the year and then you know, working backwards in time. All right, so it turns out this kind of runs on the wrong side of a bunch of SEC laws, a bunch of IRS laws, but it was really common. I mean, damn near everybody in the US, all the publicly traded companies were doing this. So um, when I was listening to you know, the guy in the office next to me talk about this, I was thinking, well, shit, we should trade on this. So uh, we started trading on it. And what happened is it worked sort of really well at the start, and then it kind of you know, it was still working and then sort of almost overnight it switched and it vanished. So essentially this is, you know, this, is, this was sort of proprietary information. So you're looking at guys who are making uh, abnormal returns in the markets, you know, they've got to be figuring out stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, so, you know, my interpretation was, you know, at some point, sort of the guys in the market figured out what was going on. So what we were doing is, is we were basically taking short positions on these companies in anticipation that 
the SEC would announce an investigation and the stock price would fall. Yeah, and, and so it worked for a while. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and I then guess you can probably take another step and like tip off SEC that these guys are doing this. <laughs> Does that uh, cross some back. lines? Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's actually, that part is harder than it looks. Um, so I, I did spend some time at the SEC, and SEC was sort of constantly inundated with people saying things like that. And in fact, every insider trading case that I know of, I mean, that I was involved in, all started with somebody calling the SEC and they were pissed off because somebody else made more money than they did. And they wanted to get in trouble. <laughs> so, I mean, this is sort of another, you know, mechanism for how this, you know, the information shows up in prices. I guess you could even fake a call, right? Like if you if you could induce a SEC investigation, if, if there is no reason, just the news of, of that investigation possibly happening could affect the stock price, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> Sounds like a fun game to play, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it, it gets even it gets even more complicated than that too, because if a company believes that that's going to happen, what they will do is they will pre-announce. So in other words, uh, you'll see the stock price sort of at the first, you know, inclination that there's something awry. And if the SEC comes in afterwards and announces an investigation or Department of Justice, um, basically, yeah, you, you don't see any reaction then because it's already been reflected in the price. Right, right. Information huh. games, very interesting. Yeah, so I mean... You know, markets are actually a whole lot more rational than than what I keep what I think people think about. Um, I would agree, and I, I actually find the the idea of the self centering mechanisms very interesting. Right, uh, there's this idea in um, evolutionary game theory called evolutionarily stable strategies. Right, and evolutionary stable strategies exhibit exactly this, which is um, there's some perturbation to the system and the system just automatically without any explicit mechanism or there's a whole bunch of very subtle mechanisms that just auto corrects all the time. So it's just, it, it's auto centering and it's very, very stable. Yeah. You know, an illustration of that is there have been a couple episodes of what we call flash crashes. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, prices nosediving, you know, 10, 20, 50 percent, you know, in a matter of minutes and then sort of rebounding. So, you know, I, I haven't seen any really good analysis of those, but my conjecture is uh, there were a bunch of computer trading algorithms that kind of got into positive feedback loops mm -hmm. and they just sort of you know, <clears throat> kind of went awry. Um, just one right. thing that would be cool to check is if somebody made billions of dollars during that flash, and maybe it was also caused by somebody, right? Yeah, uh, you know, and if see that that's what you'd really like to do is you'd like to have, you'd like to trigger somebody else's algorithm to go wacky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Adversarial trading, yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, but it turns out there are actually a whole bunch of rules against that stuff. I mean, it's really frowned upon. Uh, mm -hmm. No sense of humor from the SEC about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of things that you kind of naturally do if you're trying to design these algorithms because you're looking at it from the perspective of, oh, okay, I need to allow for that possibility. So how do I do it? Okay, uh, you know, if the stock price falls by more than X percent in you know, one minute. Um, not only do I want to sort of, you know, stop my normal trading strategies, but I probably want to go on the other side of that and buy it. So I think that's sort of what, what has happened because we haven't seen any more of these uh, episodes, at least that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so curious. once again, that's the Black Shoals kind of magic riding on the chaos machine. Well, but it's 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 this sort of you know self-correcting mechanism. Right. I mean that, that that's sort of the great thing about you know about financial markets. Um, you know they tend to reflect information really well. Um, you know, are, are there small perturbations around that? Yeah. Um, you know, is there drift? Good, yes, there is drift. Right? Yeah, and you know, if you're a good trader, uh, you can kind of pick up on that. Um, I mean, one I, of the issues with the heat equation, I don't know about Black Scholes, I'm curious if it has the same problem. Like it, the, the one physical characteristic it has is if you try to solve the heat equation for the room and you have some sort of like heat source in the center, the temperature of the other side of the room, no matter how far is, it is away, it instantaneously basically transmits, uh, which is not physical. So in reality, like it takes a while to, for the heat to propagate to the corner of the room. So basically they speed up information travel in heat equations infinite, which is not physical. So I wonder if that's related to this assumption of the like absolute market efficiency. Um, well, I mean, like I said, I mean, markets are never going to be absolutely efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's going to be enough sort of perturbations in there to make things interesting. Um, and in fact, people don't want markets to be absolutely efficient because it'd be really dull and they want to trade. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the, the story of the Black Shoals is, um, and I relate this to David, but um, so Fisher Black and Myron Shoals, it, prior to the Black Shoals model, everyone was coming up for option prices that had the expected rate of return of the underlying stock involved in it. And they could never figure out how to quantify what that was. Consequently, none of their models worked. So what Myron Scholes said is, hmm, what if we hedged that stock price risk sort of instantaneously? Well, if we did that, okay, then uh, we should get uh, you know, a risk-free rate of return. Hey, we know what that risk-free rate of return is. So that was the key insight that led to uh, the Black-Scholes model. Um, they played with around with their equations and then they realized that uh, they had second order differential equations with boundary restrictions and Fisher Black said, hey, I remember these, these are heat transfer equations. I don't know how to solve those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. The rate, of the rate of transmission of information, I think, is a very interesting topic in and of itself. But uh, guys, we're way over time this time, but uh, that's great. <laughs> Hi, and if you can scrape out uh, an hour, just ping me and uh, on Wednesday, uh, and we'd love to have you join the call if you're up for yeah, it. Yeah, I'll check my calendar. I think I start work at nine, but uh, yeah, in that case, I will definitely join you guys. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll reach out. Thanks, man. All right, okay. uh, okay. I got to roll. Thanks, Thanks guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.